Timothy, District 41, Paul Aisley, and Mary Brew. Now, members, please be seated. Mr. <coughs> Aisley, if I can have you do an opening statement, you have one minute. Uh, thank you very much. I've been here with you guys before, so thanks for having me back. It seems to be one of the least Democratic assembly people. Sir, can you speak to the microphone, please, sir? Okay. Thank you, sir. Let's get really close. Is this good? About an inch away. Just, just pull it. There you go. How's that? Okay, thanks for having me here. I've been here before. I've talked to you before. And I just want to stay out front listening to some of the testimony. I am a Democrat, fairly conservative one, but I am a Democrat. I'm listening to the comments that are going on. I came to Nevada in 1968. I applied for a job at Nevada Southern University. I was hired as a professor of mathematics. Stayed there for 40 years. And after that, I went to run for the assembly. I won three races, 2008, 10, and 12. Lost my last race, and I'm back now. Assembly District 41 starts at Warm Springs Road and goes south to the end resort. It's on both sides of I-15. Again, listening to the comments I've heard, you might think I'm an academic and have no business experience. My wife and I started a small business, lasted for four years. We started a nonprofit, lasted for 16 years. That was a magazine that went to nonprofit to all the high schools in Clark County. At the university, I ran the summer program, I had to, which is a program that pays for itself. I ran the continuing education program, paid for itself. I never had to borrow a penny from anybody to run these programs. So the summer program was a mess when I got it, and I fixed it. And for the 20 or so years that I ran the summer program, balancing the needs of students versus the needs of instructors, the thing went very well. And continuing education, I was that dean for 13 years and dealt with almost all aspects of the business and community in Las Vegas, including the hospitals, the hotels, the casinos, travel agents. Almost all of them had some interaction with continuing ed. So I'm well aware of the business population or businesses in the state. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Mary Rooney. Well, good morning. Um, I'm Mary Rooney, and I am running for the assembly seat in District 41. I am fortunate to have the endorsement of Vicki Doolin, our current assemblywoman, who has chosen for personal reasons not to run for re-election. However, she is supporting me to continue the good work, the fine work she has already begun in the legislature. Uh, my experience as far as being an assembly person is that I have been both an employer and an employee. I worked for Sears for 18 years in various human resource capacities. So I know what it's like to, to be an employee, an employee. I know what it's like to have a legal department and an IT department at my interface. I also know what, it's, what it means to be a small business owner and manager. My husband and I ran two small businesses. One was a data processing business, one was a construction business. And that's where I experienced firsthand the problems that small business faces today. Uh, in, with, with excessive regulation and excessive taxation. So I want to run, I want to get to Carson City so I can use some of my experience to change the course of action that I see our state taking. I would like to limit some of the taxation and regulation. Thank you very much. I want to remind the interviewees that we will adhere to a one minute response. <coughs> uh, that being said, I'm going to start with Mr. Steelman, Mr. Yes. Jonas. Uh, good morning. Thank you guys for both being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jim Jonas. I am the uh, radio show host for Veterans of Politics. Uh, my question is for uh, you, Mr. Aisley. You know, one of the things that has always really confused me uh, is teachers, benefits package, and salaries in the state. Now, I understand that a lot of people believe that teachers don't get paid enough uh, for what they do. One of the things that I've would like to see happen is, is that teachers can't negotiate their take-home pay versus their benefit package, but teaching assistants can. So in other words, when teachers actually sign a contract, 
they sign a contract that has the benefit package also and then what their take on pay is going to be. Wouldn't it be cost effective to the state if teachers could actually negotiate where they would take home more money and their benefits package would be a little bit less and altogether the package would stay the same for the taxpayers? I'm not sure that I agree with all of the ways you laid things out. I was, you're talking mostly about the K-12 teacher, not the university professor? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, as far as I know, they are in the PERS system, and they have had benefits, both the public employee retirement system. Both systems, from my point of view, are working okay the way they're structured. I don't know the distinction you're making between teachers and the teachers' assistants. They're all employees and they have contracts. I do know that my granddaughter just got a contract to be a teacher. But they give her a year-long contract with no benefits and she can't vote for anything. So if you think there's something wrong with the system, I would have to have to agree with you. It's not it's not well it's not strictly for the benefits of the teaching faculty. I think that needs to be improved. Okay, thank you. That's pretty much what I was getting at. Right, thank you. Next question. Uh, Rob Lauer, U.S. Army. This question is for both of you. It's a yes or no question. Um, number one, did you support the commerce tax and the $1.3 billion tax increase last year by the governor? Number two, would you vote to unwind it if you're elected? Yes or no for both of you? No and yes. No, I did not support it. In fact, I am trying to work further to get it repealed. And I, I do not think the commerce tax is, is a, a viable uh, taxation tool for the state of Nevada. Seriously? I was not there in the assembly, so to say whether I support it or not is kind of not meaningful. I, I would have thought a profits tax would have been better than a, a gross receipts tax. And so that was. That, that wasn't the question, um, sir. Just, I just, well, yes or no, you're welcome to expand on no. she did, but, but just please give a direct it's question not, answer. It's not a yes or no question, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. I, if that is stands now, yes, I would have I would have supported it, and no, I'm not going to run there and do away with it, but yes, I'm going to go look at taxes. Good morning, my name is Robert Faust. Thank you both for being here today. My question is, where are you at on concealed weapons on campuses, and who should carry them, and who should Absolutely 100% opposed to concealed carry on the campus. We have seen examples of experienced police officers shooting a 12 year old boy with a toy gun. And if you think that an amateur is going to do something better in a crowded room with a lot of contention, I just see it as a shootout. I don't see it as a solution to the problem. Ms. Uh, Rudy? Yes. Um I'm in favor of concealed carry. I believe the Constitution applies to uh, campuses across the country as it does anywhere else. Thank you. Next question. Len <coughs> Connell, and this uh, question is directed at both of you being uh, esteemed teachers. Um, UNLV misses out, and the state of Nevada misses out on billions and billions of dollars of corporate funding, government funding, whatever else that can bring jobs into the state simply because we are not a tier one research university. So we have a Democrat and a Tea Party here. So uh, if elected, would you address that? And would you have a plan uh, to make us into a research university so we could bring that money into the state? Let's have Mr. Easley uh, answer first. University is on track to become a major research university. It is getting there extremely slowly. I would agree with that. If you're going to spend 60 plus million dollars on a stadium, and another 25, 30 million dollars starting a medical school, and another 35 million dollars building a hotel building, you're not on track to become research one. And it's always, in this state, there's a lack of funds to do what we need to do. And this is just another example. On the other hand, I'm very strong in supporting the, what's called the Cooley Springs Ice Age Park, which will be a research facility. Once it gets built, we have a lot of fossils. The kids are interested. They like it. I compare it to what went on in Arizona, where they had Kid Peak Observatory. Years ago, the school built up. They had a lot of support from the federal government for the park. 
we were the only state for a while that had no national monument. Now we have one. I certainly supported that, and it could lead to tier one if, it, if the right things were done. The smart. Is that it? No. Five more seconds. Okay. We don't support STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. When I arrived on the campus, my math office was in a, was in a trailer, and when I left, it was in a trailer. This is not progress towards research funding. Ms. Rooney? Yes, I would support um, turning the uh, University of Nevada into a tier one research facility. I think research and technology certainly is the way of the future, and I think anything we can do to further that goal is a, is, is a worthy one. I know there has been talk about getting a uh, medical school into the university. I think that would be a, a good step. Uh, I do think that once you get the medical school and then the residencies here, it would do a lot to improve the medical care that we have here in the Valley. Thank you. Next question. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ron Q. This question is toward to Ms. Rooney. Uh, let's say you're elected today. What committee do you think you're best fit in in Carson City? Uh, I really haven't given that much thought, but I think as far as my interest goes, I would like to be on the education committee. I think education is the core of our, of our culture, and we have to do whatever we can to improve the education system here in Nevada. And I think that we have to have some very innovative, new types of thinking in the education area. And the same old answers of more money, you know, smaller class size, even school choice, which I am in favor of, I don't think it's enough. We need some really new innovative thinking, and that's where I hope I could make uh, some progress. Thank Next you. question, please. <clears throat> this one's for Paul. Uh, Paul, in the past few years, you've taught math at Ellis Air Force Base and the Gene Prison. Uh, how will this be an asset for you, uh, not only uh, in the position you seek, but also for the uh, members of District 41? Well, for one thing, I'm very supportive of the military and education on military bases, is why I taught at uh, Ellis a few times. I also did an evaluation of the Air Force Base in uh, Florida, Northern Florida, and one of the Idaho. I, I've forgotten their names. But it's important that we do the courses that will get let the officers move forward. When I was in Arizona, I worked on a special summer course where the Marines were in, under high pressure. This was back in the 60s to get their master's degrees. And I was working with them in the summer. They're a great bunch of kids to work with because Unlike the general population, when you tell someone in the military to do the homework, they do it. It's very easy for a teacher to like that. The other, what was the other part of your question? You pretty much answered it. I just want to basically know how is your educational background, especially with the prison and Nelson Air Force Base, how is that going to be an asset in Carson City? The, pri the prison is another another issue. I mean, we have too many people in prison. Someone mentioned we pay $10,000 a year for a kid in school. We pay $30,000 a year for a guy in prison. And to put people in prison for things like an ounce of marijuana, is, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Edwards? Good morning. Uh, Mike Edwards, you know, the United States Marine Disabled Vet and President of the Banditos Motorcycle Club here in Las Vegas. I work very closely with the U.S. vets and homeless veterans uh, that we have here in the Valley and statewide. 2014, there was a, a call to action put out by the First Lady trying to help this problem, and then they, the government has announced that we have a functional zero. That means that we have enough services and programs in place for every homeless vet, but as of right now, we have over 300 homeless vets that are awaiting uh, these services. It takes about 90 days, once you're recognized, to get into permanent housing. And um, so there are, there's the volunteers, there's the resources, we have everything we need. At a, at a stand down we recently had, we had about 800 to 1,000 homeless vets at the Cashman Center. U.S. Vets does a great job, but I work with Shalomar very closely, and they're very, even though they say the resources are there, they, they are always looking for money. They've got plenty of volunteers. They don't have the, the money or the, the support from the city and the government that they could need. If, if you are elected, would you make it a priority to help with the homeless vet population here, especially in Clark County? All right, we'll start with Mr. Hazley on the answer. 
Well, my feeling about the military, the police, the first, the first responders, the firefighters, these are people that will risk their lives for my benefit, my family's benefit. From my point of view, anything you want, you can have. Now the question is, where's the money? Yes, sir. Ms. Ms. Rooney. Okay. Right. Um, I do believe that uh, if there is any population in our country that should be supported and cared for, it is our veterans. And I do believe that we should be able to provide them with the resources they need to live a dignified life. I would question, though, how some of the money is spent. I agree that uh, we should, as I said, support them, but I don't think just throwing money at programs that don't work is the answer. I think we have to find ways that do work, and whether it means um, some kind of pilot programs to, to try to address this issue, I think we should do whatever we can, again, to come up maybe with some new kinds of thinking, some new programs, new ways of addressing the problem. Because evidently, from what you said, some of the old ways aren't working. Um, but I would certainly support increased funding for veterans if it was proven that this was needed. Our next question, please. Thank you, it's something to John Moore. Um, what is each of your stand on the Bundy issue with the, in regards to uh, the BLM and the federal government uh, trying to take their land and that sort of thing? What is your stand on that? We'll start with Ms. Rudy. I think this is a very complicated issue and it's very difficult to really get to the facts of each matter that has been brought before the public, and I'm thinking of the Oregon standoff and the standoff right here in Bunkerville. My personal belief is it all stems from an overreach by the government in controlling 85% of our land. I don't think, I, I think that is the crux of the problem, and I, I think that whenever you, you look at the numbers that what, 20, 25 years ago there were 50, 54 ranchers in the state, now there's one. It's a little hard for me to believe that there's not an agenda here on the part of the Bureau of Land Management. On the other hand, they do have a function to serve. So I think, uh, personally, I think this is something that requires a lot of different facets of government to get together and to ferret it out. But I, personally, my sympathies lie with the ranchers. Most of them were here long before the Bureau of Land Management. Mr. Easy. Well, there is a problem with ranchers and public lands. It's not just here at uh, Goldview or near Bundy's Ranch, but it's all across the north through what they call the checkerboard pat pattern. I'm somewhat familiar with it, but what Bundy did and what he didn't do brought this thing on himself. Other, other ranchers in the area paid fees or were bought out by the federal government. Mr. Bundy was extremely stubborn. He did not recognize the fact that he was letting his cattle out on BLM, which is federally owned land, it's not his land, he wouldn't pay for it, he would not obey any of the laws. If you are a person who believes in being a law-abiding citizen, Mr. Bundy is not a law-abiding citizen. I think the BLM and the federal government acted very cautiously by withdrawing, but as soon as he was available, able and available to be picked up and captured, he was there, and I think it's the proper step. It was done safely, the minimum amount of uh, harm to the population. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi there. Uh, I'm Scott Lofato with the Conservatives for Energy Freedom. We're a national organization. I happen to be the state director. Uh, Paul, I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to ask you, in terms of energy, um, if you're presented with a bill this next legislative session and you're elected, uh, would you support uh, uh, restrictions on on the Public Utility Commission in terms of uh, their rampage against solar energy here in uh, Nevada. I think I agree with your description of the Public Utilities Commission. I think it needs more regulation. I don't think they should be a free agent. There are several things happening with solar and other sources of energy that need to be clarified. We do have Nevada Energy. I think they're a responsible citizenship, but they are trying to run a big business, and the big business does things sometimes that don't benefit all the people. There are several things going on with solar energy that I don't understand. There's a uh, solar generating plant just outside of Tonopah, and 
and that energy pays them 13 cents a kilowatt hour. If you want to do it for your solar on your roof, you get paid something like 2 cents a kilowatt hour, and there are limits. So this immediately brings up questions. The other question is that the people that don't have solar feel that they are subsidizing the people with solar. That's another question that has to be looked into. There's a lot of details before I can say yes or no to legislation that I haven't yet seen. But yes, I think eventually we're going to move into renewable energy and away from fossil fuels. But it's not going to happen overnight. All right, thank you, Paul. Mary, I'm going to ask you a little different question. Uh, it's on the same subject, but uh, our Public Utility Commission is totally appointed by the governor. Uh, and uh, would you support a bill or some kind of change so that the Public Utility Commission would be uh, elected by the people? That's an interesting uh, question. I really have not considered it. I would probably say, without actually looking at the legislation and how it would be uh, implemented, but generally, I think I would, yes. I would support having an elected process as opposed to an appointed process. Okay, thank you. All right, next question, please. Mr. Aisley, uh, my name is Tim Batar. I'm a political activist and Army veteran. So I'm a Hispanic Republican. Now, I'm looking at your endorsements, it was very interesting, by the way. I saw you endorsed by Cesar Boyda, which is basically uh, to people who are not uh, brown supremacists, basically they're the version of Black Panthers. How do you hope to appeal to people like me who view those groups as being simply for division, not for unification? You look at all my endorsements, the one you're looking at is a couple years old. I don't think it's current. You look for the student. Christina Alvarez, a young Hispanic woman that I helped. There's a testimony in my web, you can read about it, how I helped her. It was in Spanish, correct? Was the one in Spanish? There was one in Spanish, I'm assuming that's who you're talking about. Oh, the one in Spanish was from uh, a consumer, and what do they call the uh, activist, a, a public activist. Her name is Olivia, not Olivia, it's uh, Elvira Diaz. And she has a, I believe she has a transgender child, and she was very happy. And I was considerate and listening to her and helping her with anything that she needed. We got a translation of her. Her English wasn't so great. We had that translated by my daughter-in-law, who was from Mexico City. And we did get the, the translation that she agreed with. So all of that is back and forth. She agreed with it. She thanked me for helping her. And I would continue to help anybody, regardless of what their background is. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Patrick Cassell. Good morning. Thanks for being here. With PERS being a major financial issue nationally, and especially in Nevada now, would you support changing the PERS retirement benefit packages to create a 401k for PERS employees, whereby the state would match up to 10%, provided they put away 5% on a two one basis to help curtail our financial in inefficiencies? I would start with Ms. Rudy on that one. I would support the general principle that a public pension system, plan, 401k, whatever, should not be any more favorable or rich or beneficial to the recipients as it is in the private sector. The private sector is basically the one footing the bill for this. And one of the, the uh, provisions I find particular, particularly onerous in the PERS system is the over generous benefits that some, not all, some people receive. I do not think there should be any difference between public and private pension retirement systems. What's good for the goose is good for the gander, whatever, however you want to say it, but I am not in favor of anything that gives public employees uh, a better retirement system than private private employees. Uh, if you go to work for somebody, there is an agreement that the company, the employer, the person is going to pay you a salary and may or may not be paying you for benefits. In the state of Nevada, I went to work for University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and there was an agreed upon amount of money that would be paid to me as salary and another part was put away for retirement. That was my compensation that was put away. The PERS account is built up on money promised to the workers. It is not public money in the sense that it comes out of their pocket. PERS has never missed a payment to any retiree 
The system has been modified and can be modified again. If you want to change the system, let's have that discussion, but don't have it based upon the fact that hers is costing money out of your pocket. It's not. You already gave the money to the employee when they went to work, and you said that they would have this for salary and this for compensation. To stress, to stress that, professors are not in hers. We, back in 1970, uh, somewhere back then, we had a choice, and most of us cho chose to go into the TIA prep, which is now called TIA, Teacher of New Service First. The same money is paid, though. The state paid into that what they would have paid into hers, which stresses the fact that the money is not the state's money. They've already committed the retirement money to a retirement system. If you don't like the system, then possibly change it. But right now, it is not public money. Hers has never missed a payment. If this unfunded liability that they talk about is a reality, then you can change it by changing the contributions to other people. That wasn't geared towards teachers. That was towards PERS. All state employees. Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. Exactly. Not, not all. It's all. It's not all the same. PERS retirement plans are different for the firefighters, for the lawyers, for the teachers. They are different in that they contribute more if they get more out of them. Let me let me stop in there because we're a little excessive. But I see Ms. Rooney. If you'd like I, to have a few, want, few minutes uh, or a few seconds to respond. Just, just a very short statement. I think that all of the laws, the discrimination laws in pension plans and the accounting laws that we have for our corporations should apply to the public sector across the board, and they do not right now. Right, you. you move to the next question, please. Okay, uh, Mr. Aisley, uh, you were in the state legislature uh, and were always uh, one of the preferred uh, candidates or people endorsed by Harry Reid and his machine. Yet, as a consequence of the 2014 deal in which essentially the Democrats supported uh, Sandoval and engaged in massive voter fraud, uh, if you're elected again, uh, would you uh, be willing to go back to counting uh, voter ballots uh, by paper as opposed to machines so people's votes would not get switched uh, by reading the software and the machines? I'm sorry, but I don't have any evidence of what you're saying as having happened. Our machine system is very reliable. There is a paper account. I don't know if there's ever been a challenge to it that's been, that's been modeled. There were four challenges, and the Secretary of State said, we cannot count the paper ballots. We have to use what the machine said. And essentially, the machines would say the same thing. Uh, this is going on all over the place in that the machines are not reliable. They're easily hacked. And they were hacked dramatically in the 2014 election, uh, which is why he lost. Of course, I would change that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from any of the panel Any questions from anybody in the audience? Yeah. Right. This time, then, we'll have closing uh, statements. I'd like to ask Ms. Rooney to begin first. You have 30 seconds, and then Mr. Aisley will follow. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here before you. I do want to go to Carson City, and I do want to uh, forge some type of common goal and common ground so that we can come up with solutions to the problems that face our state today. I think part of the problems we face in government today is that we don't share common goals. When we go to Carson City, we have to go there with the idea that our number one priority is the welfare and prosperity of the families and businesses in Nevada. That's the number one priority. Not to raise taxes, not to satisfy the gaming industry, not to take care of Tesla or Faraday, but to take care of Nevada families and businesses. If we all have that number one priority, we can accomplish great things. All right, Mr. Aisley. Uh, thank you. If, if re-elected and able to serve, which I'm hoping will happen, 
I'm going to concentrate my time this time on some of the scams and ripoffs that are affecting senior citizens. Previously, most of the bills, if you want to check them out, almost every bill I have supported is because someone has asked me to do it. I don't have an agenda in, the, in going into the assembly. I like to work with the people. I know when a little, not a little, when a woman comes up to me during a committee meeting and says she is absolutely frightened that there's going to be someone coming into her house appointed as a guardian and take away her assets and her life, that's what I'm going to work on. Fortunately, it is being worked on in Clark County. Cecil Act is doing some work on it. There was legislation in the last session, and there will have to be more. Because these people, the older people, senior citizens, of which I am one, need to be protected. There, I can tell you other scams that are going on. The senior population in the town is growing. The scams are growing along with them, and I think they need protection. One other thing I just want to comment on. When you talk about the private sector, realize that there is not one private sector. You can break it down into pieces. You can look at Steve Wynn and Adelson in the private sector, and you can look at somebody with a small business running on their own. I will protect the small business every chance I get. I've done it. You can look at the record. I'm not so happy with the corporations and what they do to their employees or for other people that try to start businesses. You could ask very simply, why is there no lottery in the state of Nevada? Why don't we run our, to the... We would see our time at this point. Okay. Do some additional time. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, I want to thank Mr. Paul Easley and Ms. Mary Rooney, who are running for state assembly. <laughs> <laughs>